Greetings and welcome. This video, Petrified Titans and Organs Part 2, The How and Why, will cover a variety of potential explanations for the discoveries presented in my previous videos. We'll begin with some of the mainstream geological narratives as they relate to the findings, and then move on to alternative cosmological, religious, and mythological connections. I'll start with a brief crash course on what geology teaches us about the origins of rock, known as petrogenesis, and discuss the process of petrification as well. For the sake of argument, let us begin with the far-fetched premise that the mountain Mont Go really was once a gigantic creature, and that many of the stones found in this region are indeed the petrified remains of creatures large and small. I'd like to make it clear, I'm neither a geologist, paleontologist, or biologist, nor do I consider myself an expert on any of these topics. I'm simply a curious person who has been willing to consider ideas that many would find absurd. And in so doing, I've begun to recognize patterns in geology which challenge important aspects of the mainstream geological paradigm. Experts in these fields will likely consider me a victim of an overactive imagination, recognizing patterns where none exist, and a textbook example of the Dunning-Kruger effect someone who knows just enough about a subject to get himself into trouble. While that may be true, I'd ask you to consider just how many times throughout history our understanding of the physical world has undergone major revisions. It's easy to dismiss ideas that seem ridiculous with the wave of a hand. It's an entirely different thing to allow ourselves to examine the objective world without preconceived notions. I want to emphasize that I'm not trying to take credit for mud fossil theory. Others have spent years reporting on the biological origins of stones, and I'm more or less a newcomer to the subject. I prefer to consider myself a cross-disciplinary field researcher in what I hope will someday become the budding academic disciplines of titanology and biogeology. My contributions to these topics, if any, have been in the identification and classification of what I've taken to calling petrified organs, with particular emphasis on heart stones. I have also conducted what is, to the best of my knowledge, the most thorough forensic analysis ever performed on a titan. If there's any truth to the patterns I've recognized and presented, then these findings stand in stark opposition to what we have been told about the formation of rock. Ultimately, an integration of this information would require extensive revision of the earth sciences, as well as tenured professors willing to champion research which shakes the cornerstones of the very disciplines they represent. It's far more likely that the research I have presented will be brushed aside as coincidence or pareidolia, and if this information begins to reach a wider audience, which it appears to be doing, it'll most likely be met with hard criticism from the academic side. Mainstream geology tells us that there are three primary classes of rock, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. Igneous rock is formed when magma and lava cool. Magma, pushing upward, mixes with surrounding materials and creates a wide variety of different kinds of igneous rock. Through volcanic eruptions and collisions of tectonic plates, mountains are formed, which are then subject to fragmentation and erosion. Earthquakes, rain, wind, and chemical interactions all contribute to the breakdown of rock. Creatures, plant life, fungi, micro and macro organisms feed directly or indirectly off of the minerals of which the rocks are composed, participating in the continual process of breakdown. On the ocean floor, under the immense pressure of water, the remains of living creatures are compressed into layers known as sedimentary rock, with greater and greater pressure and heat over great lengths of time, the layers undergo molecular changes, becoming what is known as metamorphic rock. Some of these layers are said to be pushed upward by tectonic activity, and others downward, where they eventually come into contact with magma, melt, and the cycle of petrogenesis continues. These are the basics of what is found in our school textbooks. Geology tells us that the formation of sedimentary and metamorphic rock occurs in timelines that stretch between tens to hundreds of millions of years. One of these layers in particular, known as limestone, is said to form when skeletons, shells, and coral are compressed over great lengths of time. This is not the same as fossilization, because the final stone is more or less a solid mass of the transmuted biological materials, 
showing none of the original creature's form. Fossils, on the other hand, occur when the remains of creatures and plant life in whole or part are trapped and preserved within the sedimentary layers on the sea floor. This process can also occur on land as well, as biological material is trapped in things such as mud, coal, ash, tree resin, and tar. In general, harder materials like bone are more likely to avoid decay and to be preserved in the process. Only in very rare cases is the softer tissue preserved. It's very likely I would never have made the discoveries I have had I not first come across mud fossil theory. The idea that petrification could happen in the blink of an eye by geological standards was new to me, and it caused me to look at the stones with new eyes. That, combined with the mounting evidence of widespread mud floods being presented by a number of independent researchers, made the idea even more plausible. If biological material is encased in mud, over time a slow exchange occurs between the fluids, gases, and tissues of the organism and the minerals in the surrounding material. In this airless, anaerobic condition, decay of the organic material doesn't occur as the microbes and larvae which normally consume the tissues cannot survive. In a process known as paramineralization, the biological material is slowly replaced by minerals and eventually transmuted into stone. This is the process of petrification or petrifaction. And there are many beautiful examples of this sort of preservation in which exquisite detail of the original internal structure remains. How long these processes really take to occur is very much open for debate. Personally, I no longer believe that it occurs over millions of years. Earlier, we took a piece of wood like this, inserted it in the steel pipe, added some water, and then sealed it up. The next step is to put it in the oven at about 160 degrees centigrade for two weeks. Now we're ready to examine the results of this experiment. We can see this wood is now darker in color. It's also softer. A chemical reaction between the steam and the wood under pressure has caused these changes to occur. This specimen isn't coal yet, but clearly the process of coalification has begun. The question is, would coal result if this experiment, or a variation of it, continued for a longer period of time? Scientists at Argonne National Laboratory have answered this question in a series of experiments performed in the 1980s. One of the earliest reports about their work appeared in the magazine Chemical and Engineering News in the November 21, 1983 issue. On page 42 of this issue, we read the following quote. Chemists at Argonne National Laboratory have succeeded in making a type of artificial coal from naturally occurring materials. The process is much less severe than formerly thought to be necessary and provides some new insights into coal structure and how to alter it. Later, after their published reports appeared in the science journal Organic Geochemistry, the British science journal Nature reported on the success of their experiments. On page 316 of the journal Nature, March 28, 1985, we read the following. Winans and his colleagues at Argonne National Laboratory have taken less than one year to prepare a thoroughly characterized synthetic coal. The material they produce is indistinguishable from the real thing by all the techniques so far applied to it, and its synthesis raises many interesting questions in coal chemistry. This coal fine wood specimen comes from La Salle, Utah, a uranium mine. Its presumed geologic age is around 140 million years. This specimen of coalified wood comes from a uranium mine in the Temple Mountain area here in Utah. Its presumed age is also 140 million years. But look how closely this specimen resembles this other piece of wood. They're nearly identical. It's interesting to note that this other piece of wood was derived from a fresh piece of wood like this just a few weeks ago. This close similarity raises an important question. Is it really true that this piece of coalified wood from La Salle, Utah, and this piece of coalified wood from Temple Mountain, Utah, are really 140 million years older than this piece of wood which David and I recently obtained in some of our experiments? Not really. Catherine Gill Bay, Australia, not far from this coastal area near Flat Rocks Point, is an object of extreme geological interest, an ancient tree. The fossilized remains of this tree can be seen extending through over 12 feet of sedimentary layers between two coal seams located here. Years ago, when a mining company excavated the layers exposing the tree, 
the bottom of the tree could be seen extending down to the lower coal seam. Since that time, the lower part of the tree has broken off. Even now, in its reduced length, the tree extends through layers geologists normally theorize to have taken hundreds of thousands of years to accumulate. But these layers could not have taken long ages to accumulate because the tree would have rotted long before the sediments would have had time to accumulate around them. Rather, this tree is mute testimony to its catastrophic burial by at least two sequences of volcanic ash deposits. As the evidence indicates, the tree was probably buried in a series of closely spaced volcanic ash flows, perhaps similar to the catastrophic burial of thousands of trees at Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Initially, I considered a massive mud flood as a potential cause of Montgo's demise to be within the realm of possibility. There certainly seems to be no shortage of evidence around the world for such an event. It happened here in the early summer of 1912. In late May, a series of earthquakes started to rattle this once lush valley. The native Alaskan people who had lived here for hundreds of years sensed something was terribly wrong. Gathering their belongings, they fled just in time. On June 6th, a volcano named Novarupta suddenly exploded with cataclysmic force, a force 10 times greater than that of the Mount St. Helens eruption of 1980. Great geysers of magma shot into the sky. Rivers of superheated lava flowed into the valley. The sheer volume of what was ejected from Novarupta is still mind-boggling. 15 cubic kilometers of magma alone. Rivers of superheated gas and ash raced into this valley 12 miles away, flattening lush forests and vaporizing trees. Palu is particularly vulnerable to liquefaction because it sits on silt deposits carried down from rivers. Liquefaction uh, is where the soil or sand, uh, which is, has water in it and air, shakes and turns into a liquid-like substance. And As seen in these satellite images, liquefaction wiped out large areas in the city of Palu, such as Balaroa and Potobo. It wasn't long, however, before I began to see major problems with the theory. The first, and most obvious, was how could a two and a half mile long, 2,500 foot mountain beside the sea remain covered in mud long enough for the paramineralization process to occur? Where would all the mud have come from, or disappeared to? The more I thought about it, the crazier it sounded, but up until that point, Mud flood was still the only explanation I had for the mounting empirical evidence that I was finding. When it comes to mud floods and the cleanup that follows their aftermath, the massive deposits of earth are only removed with extensive effort. Where no effort is made, the mud remains, and the ground level has simply been raised. Examples of this can be seen in cities all over the world for those who have eyes to see. But even so, the idea that the area surrounding Montgo was once 2,500 feet higher than present day seemed highly unlikely. A short time later, on a hike with a friend, I found evidence that made the mud flood theory seem just a tad less far-fetched. After introducing the topic of star forts to my friend, he said to me, you know, I think I've been to one of those forts in Cerebernia. Cerebernia is a beautiful mountain range located just 15 miles from Mont Go as the crow flies. And if Titans truly did exist, then this mountain range could definitely be a candidate. Now the interesting thing about this particular star fort is that it's perched 
at 2,700 feet altitude, 200 feet higher than the peak of Mont Go. It also, quite unexpectedly, happens to be two-thirds covered in mud. It's interesting to note as well that the regions of Benidorm and Alicante below the mountain range consist primarily of rolling hills of loose earth which definitely look to have been deposited by flow. Suddenly, and quite unexpectedly, I was presented with evidence of a previous mud flood in the region that appeared to have reached higher than the peak of Mont Go. But even with this new information, I was still quite skeptical that a mud flood could really account for Mont Go's petrification. So my quest for a more plausible explanation continued. Up until this point, I had still not yet found the first of the heart stones. But it wasn't long after finding the first that I began to find them in large numbers. And between these stones and the Bernia star fort, evidence for mud flood in the region was mounting. I had to admit though, while mud flood did offer an initial explanation for the remains of the smaller creatures that I was beginning to find all over, it also raised questions which were not easily answered. Namely, where were the rest of the bodies? And why was I only finding organs? Paramineralization lies at the core of mud fossil theory and is helpful in explaining the existence of fossilized body parts, but it did not, in my mind, explain the prevalence of the stone organs that I was finding. And while I was sure that some of the rocks I was seeing might be the fragmented remains of other body parts, I was finding no intact skulls, spines, ribs, pelvises, arms, or legs. It was puzzling, and it took a while before I came across information which started to help me form alternative explanations. There are several examples of what may be rapid petrification caused by high mineral content waters. One of them can be found in a popular tourist attraction known as the Wishing Well at Mother Shipton's Cave in England. Because of the high mineral content of the water, objects remaining exposed to the water for any length of time soon become encased in a mineral shell. People leave objects for a matter of months and later return to find them hardened. While they appear to be stone on the outside, the objects have not yet had their original materials replaced through and through. If such dramatic changes can happen within months, it's not hard to imagine that they would eventually become fully hardened in what would essentially be a blink of an eye by geological standards. This is Lake Natron. The lake takes its name from the natural compound which is comprised of sodium carbonate, baking soda, and volcanic ash. Temperatures at the lake are frequently above 104 degrees Fahrenheit and can reach as high as 140. The environment is highly alkaline, toxic to most creatures, and also provides the perfect conditions for rapid petrification. While it looks like the petrification is instantaneous, you should know that the photographer who took these photos has taken artistic license with the creatures, which despite having hardened outer shells of mineral, were still soft enough to reposition them in the poses seen here. Here is another example of rapid petrification. This cowboy boot was found with a petrified foot and ankle. Some might think this to be a hoax, but the preserved internal bone structure has been revealed by elaborate CT scans performed in a hospital. Somehow, I doubt the boot is millions of years old. As you can see, there are a variety of ways in which the petrification process can happen quickly, both artificially and by natural means. Artificial petrification has been brought about in several different ways. Let us not forget the gruesome works of Girolamo Sagato and his techniques for turning flesh to stone, which are still unknown to this day. Petrification can be brought about through exposure to heat and pressure. It can also happen as a result of being submerged in waters with high mineral content, surrounded by mud, or any combination of these conditions. Considering all of these geological anomalies, how could we possibly know the true age of different kinds of rocks and fossils? We've already seen examples of trees growing through multiple layers of strata. Such anomalies cast doubt on the use of strata as an effective tool for dating. 
But what about the layers of strata themselves? Is there evidence that conflicts with claims that they're formed over tens to hundreds of millions of years? We're here at this cliff on the North Fork of the Toodle River, which shows the very beautifully preserved pyroclastic flow deposits from June 12th, 1980. Late in the evening, about 9 p.m. to midnight, this deposit was formed rapidly during three hours. You can see the effect of the pyroclastic flows. The coarse and the fine material is separated into thin layers called laminae. And the laminated appearance of the pyroclastic flow deposits is really interesting because it shows us that particles can be separated at high speed. These pyroclastic flows are moving at about 100 miles per hour. As the grains were being propelled over the surface in a slurry, the particles separated coarse and fine into thin layers. I had thought that a catastrophe would mix up all the, the particles and make a homogenized deposit. Boy, was I wrong. Right here, a pyroclastic flow moving at freeway speed or higher can separate particles into coarse and fine. So layering doesn't require millions of years, thousands of years, or even hundreds of years. It can form rapidly in this slurry flow process. So Mount St. Helens tells us something really interesting about how rapidly strata can form. There's even micro-thin lamination in this deposit. It's uh, remarkable. There are a host of different techniques used by geologists for determining the age of things, most of which are not easily understood by the layman. It's important to understand that the science behind each and every one of these techniques has been criticized and the various flaws are well documented. Nevertheless, criticisms of the techniques fall largely on deaf ears, likely because they're often levied by Bible believers assumed to have a vested interest in proving their faith. But just because they're Bible believers doesn't mean their science is wrong. Over the years, I've seen countless examples of poor science and straight up lies from every corner of academia. Nowadays, anytime I hear the claim that all scientists are in agreement or that the science is decided on something, my ears immediately perk up and I begin to question whether someone is trying to pull a fast one. For those who might be wondering whether I've approached this research from a religious perspective, the answer is no. So I find it quite bizarre that the empirical evidence that I've gathered over the last couple of years might represent some shred of proof in favor of ancient cosmologies, young earth theories, and creationism. This picture, which I've already shown a number of times in my videos, is from Hot Springs, South Dakota, where the largest collection of mammoth remains in the world have been found. The creatures were apparently trapped after falling into a sinkhole, which then slowly filled with mud and silt. What if something similar to the volcanic eruption in Alaska, which you saw earlier, were to happen on a much larger and more widespread scale? Obviously, there'd be no need for sinkholes to trap living creatures, as the world itself would become a sinkhole. This is the Ring of Fire. There are typically 50 to 60 volcanic eruptions per month on average. Now imagine if that number, along with the size and intensity of the eruptions, were to dramatically increase. As you've already seen, ash, water, and mud can all lead to petrification. Earthquakes and volcanic eruptions go hand in hand. With earthquakes come tsunamis, bringing mineral-rich water to the mix. If you're wondering where the mud may have come from, I've yet to mention the mud volcanoes, of which over 1,100 have been identified on or near land, or the undersea volcanoes, which are said to number over 1 million. It seems obvious that widespread mud volcano activity may also have played a role in the worldwide mud flooding. The mud had to come from somewhere, right? We don't need to look to the heavens for comets or asteroids if we're looking for plausible causes of worldwide catastrophe. Indeed, we have more than enough right here. It's well known that volcanic ash is capable of blocking the light of the sun for extended periods of time, dramatically decreasing world temperature, 
and leading to extinction-level events. One need only look to the Siberian permafrost where flash-frozen woolly mammoths remain perfectly preserved for evidence of this. There are also more recent examples. Following the eruption of Mount Tambura in 1815, so much pyroclastic material reached the Earth's atmosphere that the temperatures dropped, causing worldwide incidences of extreme weather. The year of 1816 has come to be known as the year without a summer. Ask yourself how much of the world's population would perish if we were to go a full year without a harvest. With larger volcanic events, high levels of volcanic ash reach up into the atmosphere bringing mud rain, which then saturates the earth, mixing with the salt water deposited by tsunamis, creating a naturally occurring concrete. Ancient Egyptians and Romans discovered that by adding volcanic ash, that concrete could harden even when underwater. I'd like to give a warm shout out to the channel WiseUp, who's produced a number of videos showing how these events can also lead to petrification of architectural structures and technological devices. And this is very likely why, other than pyramids, we find no traces of advanced technologies from pre-flood civilizations. Archaeologists give us silly stories about how these forms and buildings were carved from solid blocks of stone by people with primitive tools and far too much time on their hands. Anyone questioning this story, wanting to investigate, will run up against UNESCO control, which protects the sites from independent investigations, and the mainstream narrative prevails. Oh, and I haven't even mentioned supervolcanoes, also known as calderas. Supervolcanoes are capable of ejecting 1,000 cubic kilometers of material or more. To put that in perspective, we're talking about a single event equivalent to 350 simultaneous Mount St. Helens eruptions. In other words, if one of these go, it's game over. And there are supposedly at least 20 of these buggers around the world. This brings us to pyroclastic flows. Pyroclastic flows are powerful volcanic ejections of superheated gas, ash, and stone. They've been known to reach speeds in excess of 450 miles an hour, with temperatures as high as 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. Not surprisingly, they destroy anything in their path by burning, crushing, or both. I mentioned these at the end of my last video as a potential cause of Montgo's demise, and I'll return to that shortly. This is Araucaria mirabilis, a petrified pine cone found in Argentina. It's a beautiful example of the pear mineralization that occur as a result of volcanic activity. These trees, with their massive pine cones, once reached heights of 300 feet, but were knocked over like twigs during a volcanic eruption and then covered with ash. Over time, water seeped into the deposits, digesting the organic material, slowly depositing the minerals that resulted in the detail that you see here. Clearly, there are no shortage of terrifying circumstances which can lead to rapid petrification. But you may be wondering now, as I did, how can any of these explain the large numbers of freestanding heartstones I've found? The more of them I found, the more I puzzled over this. The most common questions I've received in my comments sections are, why just hearts? And where are the other body parts? If these were mud fossils, I would have expected to find them embedded within the body's remains. Instead, the stones were whole, unbroken, and when fractured in any way, their flaws were immediately apparent. My intuition told me that whatever caused this petrification had to have been a sudden and violent event that literally burned the rest of the body away, but for some bizarre reason left the organs intact. Bone I could understand, but organs? Soft tissue? It made no sense. Then one day, while looking at anatomy pictures, I came across this image and understood. All of the organs in the body are wrapped in their own individual sacs of fatty tissue called fascia. This tough layer protects the organs from impact and keeps them in their own individual ecosystems. The layer surrounding the heart, known as the pericardium, is particularly strong. Each of the organs is attached within the chest and abdominal cavities, separated by fascia and floating in liquid. That was when the light bulb turned on in my head. I thought of the traumatic transformation that occurs when boiling an egg. 
The inner fluid portions of the egg, protected by the outer shell, hardened in a matter of minutes with relatively low heat. It was then I realized that the organs were likely hardening like eggs as the outer portions of the body were being burned away. The chest and abdominal cavities are filled with fluid, which would function like a pressure cooker, rapidly boiling the organs. By the time the outer portion of the body was destroyed, the organs would have hardened enough to be preserved. The ash, mud, water, and minerals outside of the body would then complete the process. You can see in this picture that most of the pericardium is still intact, and where it's chipped or worn away, the fleshy heart muscle is revealed. It seemed like a good theory, but I still didn't understand why I wasn't finding long bones, skulls, pelvises, etc. After all, the bones were already hard to begin with. Why wouldn't they have also been preserved? It was in conversation with my friend Nathan, whose introduction to pyroclastic flows I showed in my last video, that the bone question was finally answered for me. I had just finished sharing my pressure-cooked boiled organ theory with him, and then he asked me if I had ever made bone broth. Being a lifelong vegetarian, I'd never had a reason to cook bones in a crock pot, so I was completely unaware that within just a few hours of relatively low pressure and heat, bones will turn to sponge and then eventually cook down to nothing. A lahar, as I showed before, is composed of hot volcanic ash mixed with water and earth and stone, creating heat and immense pressure. This means that a lahar functions like a gigantic washing machine pressure cooker on steroids. And just like in a crock pot, the greater the heat and the pressure, the faster the cooking time. Lahars flow downhill, but immediately lose speed and power as they spill outside of canyon walls and river bottoms. This may explain why the majority of hearts that I've found are in the valleys, with the highest numbers found in the river bottoms themselves. The pieces of the puzzle were starting to come together, but while Lahars offered a plausible explanation for the heartstone discoveries, I still didn't consider them to be a viable explanation for the Montgo findings. Even the biggest examples of Lahars on record reached nowhere near high enough to have covered Montgo. That left me, at least for the time being, with lava and pyroclastic flows as a possible explanation for Montgo's demise. I've already shown you potential evidence of a grand-scale mud flood in the region, but I've yet to mention that there are also the remains of massive volcanic activity in the area. In fact, Mont Go itself is completely surrounded by lava flow. This entire valley is covered with volcanic rock, and that rock extends all the way to the shorelines and down into the sea. I'll show you pictures of that in a moment. And then extending around this point, this whole region in here, known as Les Rotes, is also showing volcanic rock. So you can see what it looks like up close here. This is what you'll oftentimes see in the river bottoms. At first glance it looks like mud, but that's actually volcanic rock. This is what it looks like up close. See the way it extends down into the water where it probably cooled and stopped. And this is an interesting image because it's showing this overhang, which I'll show you up close in a second. And the overhang shows clear evidence of flow. So here on the bottom layer you have the volcanic stone. This is known as Tosca in Spanish and it's used for building and I'll, I'll show you examples of that in a moment. But this section here is very interesting because you have all these different clearly defined layers. And it looks like this would be earth with some rocks mixed in. But all of this dark red that you see is all petrified. It's all stone. And then even this is stone. You have to get up to this layer up here uh, before it's soft enough to crumble. So that's a, a fascinating thing because you can see that this, this was formed in different stages. Uh, this is looking inside the Tosca. Um, they've gone in and carved out the Tosca stone there. From the inside looking out. You can 
can see these lava stones still in the water. And this is incredibly fascinating. So this is limestone under here. So that's the bedrock and, and you can see clearly that the lava has come and flowed over the bedrock. This is a cave called Kova Tayada. Tayada means cut and they've gone in and cut huge amounts of stones out of this cave. This is what it looks like from the outside and you can see how big it is with the people in it. And there's actually this side and then another. Kovatayada is here. And this is the large church in Javier. It doesn't look so big in this picture because it's a fisheye lens, but um, you can see here with the scaffolding that it's a pretty gigantic building. And all of the stone for that building is said to have come from that cave. And I've been inside and the cave extends back so far and it's huge, it's cavernous inside. And it extends back so far that you can no longer see any light whatsoever. And every once in a while it's fun to, um, to let the imagination run wild. And if you look at the, the location of the mountain and you see this, there's, there's a runoff, there's a flow here. And it's interesting that if you think about the trunk coming down, <laughs> what if you got these two massive caves and this extends very, very far back might just be a flight of fancy but you can see that the that the trunk of an elephant can be quite long and this is what it looks like at the end it's a view you don't get to see very often <laughs> so who knows but it's kind of fun to to ponder the possibility Yeah, so this is uh, another view of the of the lava rock as it extends down into the into the sea. Waves after a very big storm on the Mediterranean. We'll be talking about this more next in the next video, the role of lightning and plasma as potential causes of these sorts of happenings. And uh, it's always good to remember the different stages that truth goes through. I thought that was an appropriate meme. I have to Photoshop myself in there pointing at it saying, it's a Titan. Or should I say a Mastodon Pachyderm. <laughs> in my last video, I briefly mentioned the bodies at Pompeii as a potential example of petrification caused by extreme heat. On further investigation, I learned that the bodies on display at Pompeii are actually casts made by archaeologists who poured plaster into the space that was once occupied by the bodies before being completely destroyed. Having said that, in recent times, even mainstream archaeology has begun to acknowledge that softer tissues can indeed petrify, and this information happens to be coming from Pompeii. This article is only a couple of months old and is talking about the find of vitrified brain. So vitrified just means turned to glass. And it says here, it appears that the heat was so immense it turned one victim's brain to glass, thought to be the first time this has been seen. Experts say they've discovered that splatters of shiny solid black material found inside the skull of a victim at Herculaneum appears to be the remains of a human brain tissue transformed by heat. They say the find is remarkable since brain tissue is rarely preserved at all due to decomposition, and where it is found, it is typically turned to soap. So that's called soapification. You can see here that um, soapification is a process that involves conversion of fat or oil or lipid 
into soap and alcohol by the action of heat. So to date, vitrified remains of the brain have never been found, said Dr. Pier Paolo Petrone, a forensic anthropologist at the University of Naples. So I, I believe that based on his statement that Dr. Petrone is unaware that there are at least two examples of petrified brains that have previously been discovered, one of them is this. This is a fossilized whale brain which proves paleontologists wrong. So here we have um, this is an amazing specimen because brains don't fossilize because of their soft tissue. Soft tissue doesn't fossilize and so the brain is the first thing that deteriorates. To create a situation where this could get fossilized is unheard of. Most fossils are of skeletons and scientists don't think that a mass of soft tissue like the brain could fossilize. But this is wrong. Soft tissue can fossilize in a few ways, such as by forming impressions in rock, by being replaced by minerals that preserve the original soft tissue shape, that would be paramineralization, and sometimes by a process resembling mummification of the original material. This article fails to mention the two most likely causes of this sort of uh, petrification, which would be extreme heat or electricity, which I'll be covering in the next video. After examining the presumably mineralized whale brain, Thomas said, it just couldn't be anything else. It really is what they say it is. And the same is true of original soft tissue fossils that have not been mineralized. They couldn't be anything else no matter how much of a challenge they present to the dogma of long ages of geological time. So here they're talking about the heat involved and it says this suggests extreme radiant heat was able to ignite body fat and vaporize soft tissues a rapid drop in temperature followed. So that's what I'm talking about with the organs as well, that there's some kind of an extreme heat that's igniting the external tissues of the body, and then that simultaneously is heating the organs in their fascial sacs, and the, the tissue surrounding the organs is being superheated, and they're hardening like hard-boiled eggs. So... It wasn't until years later the victim's skull was examined. We're again talking about the vitrified brain. Uh, and they discovered that the brains were, were vitrified, turned to crystal, rather than saponified. The preservation of ancient brain remains is an extremely rare find, but this is the first ever discovery of ancient human brains remains, vitrified by heat, about 950 degrees Fahrenheit, produced by a volcanic eruption. So we can see here, this is clearly brain material. It's undeniable. This is a whale's brain. Got different images from different angles covering the, the same findings. And you can see in here, look at this. This is literally turned to quartz crystal inside the brain. I believe that the reason the brain became vitrified is because the original brain tissue is composed almost entirely of fat. In the fourth and fifth videos of the Unveiling a Titan series, I present what I consider to be some rather compelling evidence in favor of the theory that the fatty tissues of creatures from small to titanic can be transformed to crystal or vitrified as they undergo the rapid petrification process, whatever it may have been. In the fourth Titan video, I also show that the red blood cells, when highly concentrated, are transformed to iron ore in the petrification process. Take a look at this rock. It looks a lot like one hemisphere of a brain in which the fatty tissue has crystallized. Though the folds of the brain aren't defined as they are in these other pictures, the overall form is there. This is the corpus callosum, the place where the two brain halves connect. These are the ventricles, which is where the cerebral spinal fluid flows. 
If we take a look at the blood flow through the brain, we can see that it is most concentrated centrally, and specifically around the corpus callosum. In other words, if we were expecting to find iron ore in a petrified brain, it'd be in this region that it'd be most likely to be found. So take a look at this and note the shape and distribution of the iron ore. I'd just like to add, I don't imagine that this is an intentional effort to mislead. I think it's far more likely that these scientists are quite simply paradigm blind. We've all been taught that it's only skeletons that can fossilize, and only in the most rare cases are soft tissue fossils to be found. But what if we're all paradigm blind, and the soft tissue fossils are actually all around us, but instead of fossils, they take the names of other things like crystals, opals, geodes, agates, or stones. So again, this is a whale brain, also a whale brain, petrified brain with quartz crystal, corpus callosum, the brain is made almost entirely of fat. This is the corpus callosum, this is where the, the greatest amount of blood flow is in the brain. And this may also be a petrified brain, and you can see it looks very much like glass. So if we're going to use the term vitrified, I'd say that would apply here as well. But here's another thing to consider. We've got all kinds of different brain sizes and types, shapes. If you look inside the skull, there are all kinds of different shapes that could emerge from the different skull types and different brain types. I ran across this. It may be that it's not a brain, but what about opals? What if opals are petrified fat? <laughs> so what if this was originally brain material? Now this is a geode, but consider this. This is a bladder stone from a 95-year-old. They can be as large as this in a human. These are drawings of different kinds of kidney and bladder stones. Note the rings. They grow like rings of a tree. This is a gallbladder, and these are gall stones. These are geodes and each one of them inside is crystalline. Looks a lot like that. These are kidney stones. So what if what we think of as opals and agates are actually the petrified remains of gallstones, kidney stones, fatty tissues of different types in the body. They do have a very biological look to them. These are agates. Again, the kidney stones and the classic geode. When it comes to the mountain, I'll be the first to admit that I really don't know exactly what the mechanism of petrification was, and I'm well aware that I engage in a great deal of speculation. My channel recently came under fire for my willingness to ask questions that many would consider absurd. How dare you! Hordes of trolls flock to my channel, urging me not to procreate, to take my own life, to see a psychologist, to get on medication. Many called me the stupidest person alive all because of a willingness to question the mainstream geological paradigm and present evidence which I believe contradicts it. Many of them scoffed at the title of my first video which included the phrase conclusive proof that titans existed. 
Clearly they weren't paying attention, or didn't actually bother to watch the videos. Obviously my use of the term conclusive was meant to be tongue-in-cheek. Call it clickbait if you will. I would have thought that the photoshopped tusks on the thumbnail would have given it away. It was photoshopped, because it, it had to be. But for those that didn't get the joke, I made a point of driving it home later in the video. Okay, so if you are looking for conclusive proof, here it is. <laughs> All right, I hope you enjoy the video. While it's true I was being ironic in my use of the term conclusive, there was no irony in my research or in the findings I presented. Obviously, a great deal more research must be performed if there is to be truly conclusive proof that Titans existed. There's been a bit of income from the advertising on the channel and a few donations. That money will be going towards CAT scans on the heart stones. Um, I was about to take those to one of the local medical centers to, to have them CAT scan, but currently everything is on lockdown, so that'll happen sometime in the future, hopefully. Um, ultimately, to move this research forward, others with deeper specialist knowledge would need to join in, in particular people with knowledge of biology and chemistry. They'll have a better idea about what kinds of tests need to be performed to get more conclusive answers. And of course then there's the question of funding for the tests. A couple of people have already stepped up and offered to help with that. I apologize for the long wait on this video, which I've been promising for some time now. I had a crash of the editing software, which corrupted the project file, and I lost over a week's worth of editing work. And then after recouping the lost time, the COVID lockdown came, and now we all find ourselves in rather strange times. My next video will have a different format. I'm way too slow when it comes to editing, and these take far too long to produce, so Part three of the series will be recorded live in a chat with a friend where we'll be discussing additional theories related to these findings. We'll cover the potential role of electricity and plasma in the petrification process, and we'll be looking at alternative cosmologies and religious and mythological themes. And after that, I'll be taking a break from this research to work on another unrelated project, which I'll share more about later. Until then, Stay safe, be kind to each other, and keep your hearts soft. They work better that way.